welcome back to Remoticon. Uh, our next speaker, uh, he currently runs a startup that makes uh, PCBs using physics-driven generative design. Uh, before that, he worked in the avionics group at SpaceX, uh, specializing in the effects of ionizing radiation on electronics design. So he knows how hard it is to design space rated electronics and how the physics of space flight will do its best to kill your circuits. Please welcome Sergey Nestorenko. All right, thank you so much for that intro, Dan. Let me get my screen share set up here. All right, um, thanks everyone for joining the talk. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about a few of the many things that can kill you when you go to space, uh, as Dan alluded to earlier. There are many, many things that can. I'll only cover a few, and I'll only cover them very, very briefly. Um, so this is just meant as a quick introduction and kind of a bit of fun uh, and not really a, a full treatise on the subject. Um, so as Dan mentioned, uh, my background. Um, so before, uh, kind of in the last five years, I spent uh, at the Avionics Group at SpaceX. Specifically, I started out in the electromagnetic interference team. Uh, and then switched over to the ionizing radiation team, basically finding different ways to break electronics. Um, I wanted to show this kind of uh, picture here because it's the first flight of Falcon Heavy, which was also the first time we dipped uh, the second stage of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy into the Van Allen belts. We spent quite a few years, not just myself, of course, large team preparing for this, and that was a big milestone for us. Um, separately, I currently run uh, a startup that uses um, uh, that's trying to make a physics aware PCB compiler. Um, we're hiring. If anybody's interested in talking to me about that, please find me afterwards. But for now, let's get going and talk about space. Um, so a quick disclaimer, space is hard. Uh, and as the first chart shows here, it really is true that how much you learn about it in high school or even starting a real job at NASA or SpaceX is limited. And when you start playing Kerbal Space Program, you learn even more. And that's about how seriously you should take everything I say. Um, you know, with every, every one of these topics, there are uh, teams of researchers at universities and uh, companies uh, studying these in detail for decades, and I couldn't even come close to touching that depth of expertise. So uh, if any of this information is actually relevant to you, go further and do some more research. And uh, another plug, Kerbal Space Program is awesome. If you like space stuff, check it out. So here's a few of the topics that we'll cover. Uh, everything from environmental effects like lightning and humidity uh, to things like radiation and heat, uh, reentry plasma, tin whiskers. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into these. So the first um, effect that I'd like to talk about is the effect of lightning. Um, I kind of basically put all of these in chronological order of the life of a spacecraft. And uh, one of the first dangers that shows up when you put your spacecraft, your uh, rocket and your satellite on the pad is lightning. Um, so lightning is pretty common, unfortunately. We have to really think about it and deal with it. Um, there's basically two ways that can impact your spacecraft. Um, in the first image here, what we have is uh, an image of Falcon 9 standing at slip 40. Uh, where we actually have, thankfully, lightning towers. So these lightning towers are basically meant to be conductors that are bigger than the rocket itself. So if lightning were to strike, it doesn't strike the vehicle directly, but rather strikes the towers. But that doesn't eliminate all of the problems. Um, as you might imagine, there's quite a bit of current going through that lightning bolt, uh, which creates a very large magnetic field, which can then induce a whole bunch of other currents in your vehicle itself. Um, so despite it not being a direct attachment, you still have to think quite a bit about how your, um, you know, the current will show up in your long connectors that connect to your ground support equipment and what that will do for the rest of your electronics. Um, the second image here is even crazier. It is a direct strike uh, of lightning onto a Soyuz launch um, that occurred, uh, which is also not horribly uncommon. Um, so this, uh, happy to say that both of these launches survived and went on to do their missions and deploy their payloads without a problem, uh, which is a testament to many engineers who made that possible. Um, another fun story here is from Apollo 12, which was struck by lightning on ascent twice, no less, um, and set off all sorts of alarms on their ascent. Uh, but thankfully, they did not pull an abort switch and realize that they could switch their uh, signal conditioning equipment and restore all the uh, alarms and keep flying. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, unfortunately, some of the places we like to launch from are 
uh, places where a lot of lightning happens. Uh, Cape Canaveral and SpaceX Starbase are in some of the highest lightning dense regions in the country. Uh, Vandenberg is not, but Vandenberg unfortunately does not do a lot of launches compared to Cape Canaveral. Um, and the reason for this is uh, that we want to be as far south as we can uh, to launch, and we also want to launch eastward in most cases because that's the rotation of uh, that's the direction in which Earth rotates, and we get a little bit of boost from that um, that makes it a little bit easier to get to orbit. So um, this is kind of a, a conflict of interest, but that's why we have to deal with it. And we can't just put the launch pad somewhere where lightning is less of a problem. Um, so on the right here, we see kind of the shape, the electrical shape of a, of a lightning strike. Um, so the peak amplitude of a lightning strike can be as high as 200 kiloamps, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and at a pretty fast rise time on the order of hundreds of microseconds. Um, so obviously that is, uh, if you actually have to deal with a direct attachment, that is an insane amount of current to put up with. Uh, but even if it's not a direct attachment, the fields around uh, a lightning bolt can also be pretty crazy. So what we do in the aerospace industry to prepare for this is a whole bunch of mil uh, a whole bunch of standardized testing. Um, there's a whole bunch of tests called the mill standard tests that prepare for all sorts of things, not just lightning. Uh, but on the bottom left here, we have an example of the uh, lightning uh, test. And what it basically comes down to is you have your uh, unit under test on the left uh, and uh, some sensing and a power supply, and you take a transformer and inject a large current, uh, a large magnetic field around the conductor, one of the longer conductors you would have uh, on your equipment. And then you cross your fingers, hope it works. And if it breaks, you got to go fix it and make your design better. Another interesting source of things that can break your spacecraft are cruise ships. This is something I did not realize when I had set out. So more generally, um, around launch pads, there are a lot of radios. Um, there can be you know, radar, there can be uh, communication systems. Um, you know, they can communicate the systems, of course, on the actual rocket uh, and on your own spacecraft, and all of those things have to work together. So um, when you design a spacecraft to launch on a rocket, you have to make sure both that you are not emitting too much radiation from your radio so as to hurt the, the rocket itself, and vice versa, the rocket, uh, the, the electromagnetic radiation that the rocket emits won't hurt your spacecraft. So if you pull up the user manual of any launch provider, be it SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, ESA, so on and so forth, uh, you will see these envelopes that you have to test your spacecraft to and that uh, ensure that those two systems are compatible. Uh, but when you look at how these uh, profiles are derived, you can find all the different sources of radio and radar uh, that come up around the launch pad. And Cape Canaveral happens to be very close to a whole bunch of cruise ships, uh, which have a whole bunch of emitters. And so you have to design your spacecraft to withstand cruise ships. So this is a demonstration of roughly how that kind of testing goes to make sure that uh, either your individual units or entire spacecraft uh, meet these criteria. Um, so we uh, build these large anechoic chambers. Um, the word anechoic just means that they eliminate echo as much as possible. So all of those little triangular um, things on the walls are meant to dissipate electromagnetic waves as the electromagnetic waves hit them, basically simulating a free open space with no reflections because you would want to avoid any standing waves. Uh, messing with your test. So whether you're testing an individual unit or an entire spacecraft, you would roll it into one of these anechoic chambers. And specifically for this kind of testing, you would either have it operate and emit whatever radiation it does and pick that up with an antenna, or vice versa, blast some amount of radio energy from an antenna into your unit. And again, verify that it works and meets the envelope. Another interesting source that I never thought about um, while uh, until getting my first job there is just the amount of animals that we have at, space, uh, at uh, Cape Canaveral. Um, so Cape Canaveral is actually on a wildlife refuge. So there's all sorts of turtles, birds, bats, uh, so on and so forth that live all throughout that, that region. Um, actually, even just when you drive from the entrance to Cape Canaveral to one of the pads, you'll frequently see turtles crossing the road and I've had to stop and move them off the road to, to make sure that nobody hits them. Uh, this is a common thing. Um, so it's actually happened that uh, a previous space shuttle launch has hit a bird, I believe it was a vulture on ascent. Um, so uh, after that um, happened, NASA had to come up with an entire bird abatement plan, which led to all sorts of programs from road 
a roadkill cleanup to wildlife crossing signs, catch and release programs, sounds, uh, cameras tracking uh, birds, uh, radar, and so on and so forth. On the right here, we also have a very courageous bat that decided it wanted to go to space. So it clung on to uh, the fuel tank there of the space shuttle and rode at least a part of the way up. An ambitious bat, I would say. Another problem that we have to deal with is humidity and corrosion. Um, so because we want to launch over oceans where you know, there is no population and no risk of hurting anyone should the launch, launch go wrong. Uh, we have to deal with all the salt and the mist that comes from, uh, from that atmosphere. Um, so in particular, you know, at Cape Canaveral, you can kind of see from almost any launch pad just how close you are to, to the ocean. Uh, and something that I always underestimate is just how much of an effect that can have. Um, so, you know, for something like steel, you could be losing a millimeter per year uh, of steel mass into uh, to basically salt corrosion, uh, which of course weakens the structure of spacecraft you're trying to launch, or you know, for electronics to do all sorts of other uh, horrible things. Uh, and so we have to design special coatings to deal with this. Uh, and of course, these special coatings have to be tested uh, to make sure that they can withstand. Furthermore, in the case of uh, Crew Dragon here on the bottom left, um, it's actually designed to be reusable even after taking a swim. Uh, so not only do you have to deal with corrosion from kind of mist and, and salt in the air, but what happens when it actually uh, spends time in, uh, in the ocean after, before being pulled out. So as the vehicle takes off, um, there's quite a bit of shock and vibration that occurs. Um, so shock events are typically something that happens uh, at key points. So for example, when uh, the clamps release uh, the rocket for it to first take off, or when two stages separate, um, those are events where there's kind of a large jolt uh, that happens. Uh, but even outside of that, as you just take off, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, astronauts ride a, a rocket, uh, you can kind of see them shaking as they go up. And this is again, something we have to prepare for. Um, so we do testing um, both at the unit level and at the system level to prepare for these environments. Um, so the bottom left here, we have an example by Moog uh, of a shock test uh, where they, I believe they take a pneumatic uh, actuator and basically punch uh, a unit to, uh, to deliver the shock that you might expect uh, in a very controlled manner, of course. And in the middle, we have the James, the entire James Webb telescope basically put on a shaker table. And these environments are defined in terms of the amount of acceleration they get versus the frequency at which that acceleration occurs. And so these shaker tables will sweep through those frequencies and to those amplitudes and make sure um, that the spacecraft still holds together without any major issues. Another interesting thing um, that is perhaps a little bit less known, uh, less obvious than the previous ones, is triboelectric charging. So triboelectric charging occurs when uh, two different materials that have a slightly different affinity for electrons um, come into contact and then come apart. Um, so we experience this every day as static electricity. Uh, for the most part, when you walk over a carpet or something and then uh, you know, get shocked when you touch a door handle, um, you've had triboelectric charging happen, charge you up to some large amount, uh, something like 30 kilovolts, and then when you touch a grounded uh, door handle, you, know, you dissipate that and it hurts. Um, so the same thing happens uh, during launch. Um, as a rocket flies through you know, the air, the atmosphere, um, uh, the cloud layers, uh, the same kind of charging can happen on the spacecraft. Um, and so um, manufacturers of rockets will actually put constraints on their launches uh, to avoid this issue and prevent it from uh, you know, charging up the vehicle, causing potential arcs, or just interfering with communication. Um, so for example, the Ares 1X rocket um, had to delay some of its launches due to uh, cloud layers that could lead to triboelectric charging. Uh, same thing with Rocket Lab. Um, and on the right here, uh, we have a plot that actually shows how this charging can happen. Um, so this was a study uh, done uh, with a sounding rocket that uh, you know, went up to, I think, about 30 kilometers in altitude. And as it went up, they measured the electric potential being built up on the skin. Uh, and you can see it starting off close to zero and rising up to 30 or 40 kilovolts as it's kind of going up through the atmosphere and, of course, also returning. Um, so once we actually get to orbit, uh, we have to think a lot about heat. 
Um, and the interesting thing is that this goes in both directions. Uh, in certain cases, we have not enough heat. In certain cases, we have far too much. Um, so in the first case, uh, the Mars rovers, when sent to Mars, um, had to deal with extremely cold temperatures. The Martian atmosphere can get down very, very, very cold. And so all of those electronics were put into what's called the warm electronics box. That's the picture you see on the right, um, the technicians getting that launch prepared. Uh, simply because a lot of electronics, and especially batteries, do not perform well below a certain temperature, they actually had to provide heaters to keep them warm enough to perform. But conversely, the opposite problem can also happen. Um, so at the space station, because there is no atmosphere, there's no convective cooling. Um, which is a kind of a strong mechanism that we have we benefit here from on Earth uh, to cool hot electronics. Um, something like a heat sink on Earth here would have a fan to blow air over it, and that fan would kind of touch the heat sink and with that convection take the heat away. That's not an option. Uh, and so at the space station, they have deployed these very large radiators because electromagnetic radiation is the only way to dissipate heat. So uh, electronics will be taken and put onto these. Uh, cold plate units um, where essentially fluid will run through and will heat up and be taken to the radiators and the radiators will use electromagnetic radiation to dissipate that heat. Uh, another uh, repercussion of these extreme uh, temperature differences, it also comes up in the structural design of uh, spacecraft. So again, back in the Apollo days, um, they predicted that uh, when traveling towards the moon, uh, the spacecraft would heat up to over 100 degrees C on one side and go below minus 100 degrees C on the other side, which uh, for something as brittle as the heat shield could cause cracking uh, and could break it. And so they spent a lot of time thinking about either redesigning the heat shield to extend that temperature difference or to just provide heaters to make uh, the, heat, uh, the, of this, the heat on top of the heat shield kind of even during the coast to the moon. Uh, but the solution turned out to be a lot simpler than that, and it's called a barbecue roll. Essentially, uh, what spacecraft will do when they coast in orbit, so essentially when they're not very active, uh, is turn and spin on their axis. Uh, and that basically just evenly applies heat to all sides of the spacecraft and keeps it pretty even. Um, so on the bottom left here, you see Starman from uh, the first Falcon Heavy launch. And the reason you see that Earth rotating there is precisely this. Um, the spacecraft was performing a barbecue roll. Uh, for this exact reason. And speaking of uh, other problems with light and radiation, uh, we have a lot of issues with cameras. Uh, cameras can be quite unhappy. Uh, so an example of electromagnetic radiation causing havoc on a camera actually also occurred on Apollo 12. Um, which was, I believe, the first launch to bring a color camera to the moon. And unfortunately, uh, one of the astronauts that was on the surface, Alan Bean, uh, as he was setting it up, uh, pointed the camera at the sun and burnt out the camera tubes uh, and failed to get good footage for us there from that first launch, from that, uh, from that launch. Um, I think hopefully nobody else is using camera tubes anymore. So hopefully that's not a problem, but it has happened. Uh, and a different form of radiation uh, called ionizing radiation, in particular, particulate radiation, uh, also still causes problems to this day. So we have a picture here of uh, Chris Hadfield on a space station. And you'll notice if you watch almost any footage from a space station, quite a lot of burnt out pixels. Um, so those are pixels that were hit with charged particles, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second, uh, and cause damage burnt out and cause those artifacts. And speaking of radiation, this is a topic that uh, I enjoy seeing quite a bit on uh, forums, uh, Reddit, the internet, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, and it's great to see people super interested, uh, but it's, I find that there's quite a few misconceptions simply because we don't deal with it every day. Uh, but one misconception I'll clear up here is, I assure you, Spaceman 98, we did not forget about radiation. So radiation of the ionizing kind, so we're talking about particles now rather than electromagnetic waves, really depends on where you go. Uh, and in general, in space, there are three major sources that we think about for missions. Um, so the first source is called the Van Allen belts. Um, and in a nutshell, what's happening is that uh, Earth uh, has a molten core, which creates a magnetic field around it. And that magnetic field acts as a trap uh, because charged particles, when they uh, enter that magnetic field, will tend to get trapped in it. They will kind of gyrate and spin and go up and down uh, and kind of stay in the same vicinity. 
And so we have these gigantic uh, belts full of protons and electrons jumping all around uh, at different points, but they're definitely not uniform. Um, they have a shape, and depending on your mission design, you may or may not run into them. Um, so, for example, um, on the bottom right, we have the trajectory of, again, the Apollo missions uh, doing their uh, translunar uh, transfer from uh, low Earth orbit over to uh, lunar orbit. And you can see that because of their inclination, they actually get past the worst parts of the belts. Um, so if you look here, kind of right above the equator in this dense region is where you would get most particulate radiation. And they tend to kind of skirt around it a little bit, uh, minimizing a little bit of that problem. Uh, now, they didn't do that with that in mind by any means, but it, it is a lucky circumstance that you have to go down the middle of it. Uh, on the bottom left, we have a picture of uh, the contour of radiation at the altitude of the space station. Um, so even when you're at the space station, you're actually only inside the Van Allen belts for a relatively short amount of time uh, in this region that we call the South Atlantic Anomaly, because the SAA or South Atlantic Anomaly uh, occurs over roughly South America. And so uh, around uh, every day, there are a few orbits that the space station passes through this region. And for about five minutes, we'll have uh, quite a few more protons flying through the space station before tailing off and going back to kind of a, a relatively calm background level. Uh, by the way, the reason that this occurs in such an asymmetric way is that the magnetic field of the Earth does not actually quite go through the center of it. It's a little bit offset. And so that brings the belts a little bit closer on one side of the Earth rather than the other. Uh, the second major source is galactic cosmic rays. Um, so these are particles that are generated uh, either in our sun or in other suns in our solar system, uh, or sorry, in, a, in our galaxy, or completely in other galaxies and travel to us from, from quite far away. Uh, so these tend to be uh, even more energetic and cause an even larger problem, but thankfully there are fewer of them. Uh, and the extent to which they are a problem strongly depends again on the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the Earth's magnetic field gives us quite a bit of protection uh, if you're at a low altitude and close to the equator. But if you travel outside of the atmosphere and at the North Pole, it's as if it wasn't there. Uh, you might as well be in interplanetary space. Uh, and so different missions will have to consider, uh, depending on where they go, how much they have to deal with this. Um, an interesting uh, note about uh, the galactic cosmic rays is that we also get protection from them from the sun, uh, because our sun also has a magnetic field. And ironically, uh, when the sun is more um, active, uh, we'll tend to actually get less galactic cosmic rays because it's putting a negative pressure uh, and kind of shielding us from them a little bit more. But when it's less active, a solar minimum, that's when galactic cosmic rays become more of a problem. And the last source, as we were talking about the sun, is solar flares. Um, so the sun likes to throw us curveballs now and again in the form of more charged particles we have to deal with. Uh, and this tends to happen on an 11-year solar cycle. Um, nobody really understands why. Um, I'm sure people study it, but I have not seen a, a solid answer, and I think it's still being researched. Uh, but about every 11 years, the sun gets more and less active, and more and more of these flares happen, or less and less. And uh, these flares, when they do occur, they will first emit a lot of uh, X-ray radiation, so that's electromagnetic radiation with very high frequency, that will reach Earth relatively quickly, give us a heads up, before following through with a much larger uh, coronal mass ejection, they're called. Uh, and that's the actual protons and heavier elements that uh, eventually hit us and our spacecraft. So on the top right here, you actually see a prediction of uh, how that plasma or all those protons and heavier elements uh, traveled from the sun to Earth at a relatively recent flare we had at the beginning of this month. So one interesting misconception about radiation is that a lot of people propose shielding as a good solution to it. Um, and unfortunately, shielding is not that great at blocking radiation. Um, it certainly can work, but it's very, very heavy. Um, so for example, a uh, for something like a 400 mega electron volt proton, which we do have some of those in the Van Allen belts, not many, but some, uh, you would need as much as 40 centimeters of solid aluminum to stop that proton. Uh, and so that's obviously very heavy and in space flight mass is enemy number one. And so you want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, however, it is used sometimes. So uh, the Juno spacecraft that went to Jupiter uh, did actually use a half inch of solid titanium to protect its electronics because the Jovian belts are even more intense than anything we have to deal with. 
So why does radiation do anything to electronics? So as the name suggests, ionizing radiation means that as a particle travels through a crystal, so like a, um, you know, a PN junction uh, uh, of a part, uh, it can ion ionize the uh, atoms in that crystal. So turn them into atoms, strip their electrons away, make a charge, and then that charge will separate uh, and some of it will go into uh, you know, different regions, basically. And that can cause uh, a large temporary current, which can either flip a bit or it can actually damage your device. Um, so on the bottom left, we have uh, pictures of structural damage due to these uh, charge currents that happen. They heat up the elements so much that uh, you actually get you know, a little bit of molten metal and uh, fracturing, uh, and that can permanently destroy the device. Um, so the other way that damage occurs due to radiation is kind of less sudden. Uh, with the previous examples that I showed, uh, as soon as a particle hits a device, uh, you have a catastrophic failure uh, or even just a, a bit flip that you can kind of reboot away from. Uh, but there's another effect called total ionizing dose, where over time, the radiation will uh, slowly degrade a crystal. And this can affect uh, regular electronics. So for example, on the right, we have a voltage reference that as it was exposed to more and more radiation uh, started to drift away from its true value. Uh, and this is not uncommon, uh, but it can also cause damage to um, other materials. So for example, uh, glass uh, shown here on the bottom left uh, can degrade and uh, become less transparent. Uh, so this is a problem for solar arrays uh, or fiber optic communications and materials like that. So what you're seeing here on the bottom left is darkening of the glass uh, kind of towards the center where it's been exposed to more and more radiation. Um, another solution to this problem is to use radiation hardened parts, which are more or less practically immune um, to these kinds of strikes. Um, but the major problem with that is that just that they're expensive. Um, so, for example, the RAD750 has been used on quite a few NASA missions uh, you know, for the rovers and uh, other spacecraft. And you are getting 200 megahertz of performance for $200,000 per processor. This was priced in 2002. I don't know what these are now, but that gives you an idea. Um, so that's actually not necessarily a great way to go unless you're only making one of that spacecraft and it's extremely valuable. Uh, the way we actually try to deal with these things uh, whenever possible is to screen parts by taking them to uh, facilities where we can recreate this kind of radiation on Earth, uh, eliminating ones that we know are going to be bad, uh, and then building in a whole bunch of circuitry to try to um, uh, mitigate the effects. Uh, so these could be current limiters, these could be watchdog circuits that reboot certain parts, uh, this could be redundancy, and some combination of all of those things uh, can be sufficient to accomplish the mission with, uh, with high certainty. Uh, another problem that you get from the Van Allen belts is charging from electrons. So just like we have proton particles bombarding the spacecraft, we also have electron particles bombarding the spacecraft. And although they will not necessarily uh, have the same effect, um, they can still cause destructive failures. So electrons can accumulate at the surface of your spacecraft or penetrate deeper into the bulk of it. And again, cause charging, kind of like travel electric charging, but slightly different mechanism. And if that uh, potential builds up to too high uh, of a level, uh, you could get a discharge or an arc. And so what you're seeing here is uh, on the right is an example of a discharge that happened, I believe on orbit with the Eureka satellite that damaged the solar cell uh, because the body of the spacecraft presumably got charged up too far uh, and then discharged into the solar ray and burnt a solar ray out. And lastly, uh, or second to last effect is uh, tin whiskers. Um, this is an effect where a bulk uh, metal will spontaneously grow whiskers uh, without an electric field or without any other presumed uh, reason. Um, it is believed that this is caused by mechanical stress in crystals, uh, but it's still not a fully well understood effect, so people are researching it. Uh, but over time, as these whiskers can grow, um, that can cause a short circuit on orbit, uh, which of course could be destructive. And lastly, um, on the way back, a spacecraft will have to deal with reentry plasma. Um, so reentry plasma occurs when the spacecraft hits the atmosphere basically so hard that it turns it into plasma. Uh, and that plasma becomes kind of like a Faraday cage around the spacecraft, uh, preventing radio communications from getting through. 
Um, so in a shuttle, for example, or almost any other spacecraft going back, there will be a communications blackout period where there's no way to get any data from the spacecraft or communicate with the crew in any way. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting phenomena. Uh, and it may be possible to use higher frequency radios to communicate past it. Um, or people have also suggested like dumping materials into the plasma as the spacecraft comes down um, to try to mitigate it. Um, but so far, I haven't seen anything uh, that has actually tried to get past this. For the most part, spacecraft just deal with this problem by anticipating there will be communication at that point. And uh, just as the last moment here, I have a few other resources for anybody who likes space stuff. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff here by a lot of great creators on YouTube and um, in other places. Uh, and so I recommend checking these out if you found this interesting. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.